I would die. All right, everyone, I'd like to go ahead and get started. I'm sure you can hear me you know, okay. I, I want to welcome you uh, to the ninth uh, iteration of the Sabre Series. Uh, today we have a, a great opportunity to hear from someone at the height of the profession. But at first I want to say a couple things about the Sager Series. The Sager Series is named after Thomas Sager, class of 1976 at Wake Forest University School of Law. Tom is the former uh, Vice President and General Counsel of DuPont Corporation. Um, at DuPont, um, he made a national reputation for his advocacy, but also his contributions in the area of diversity, uh, both in corporate counsel departments, but also in law firms. Also, he's been extensively involved with um, efforts to advance diversity with the American Bar Association. In addition to that, he's associated with the DuPont, what we call, I guess, the DuPont Convergence and Partnership Model, which is otherwise known as the DuPont Legal Model, which is a benchmark, I think it became a benchmark for doing business, or doing the business of law. And so for that, uh, we are fortunate to have Tom as an alum. Um, now I want to turn to today's speaker. Um, today's speaker is Mark Chandler. I can't think of a better person uh, to talk about technology and business issues, but also someone who reflects the highest principles of the legal profession. Uh, I'll say a few things about your, your bio, but then I would like to, we're going to have a conversation. And then after that, we definitely want you to have your questions, so hold on to those as well. So. Mark Chandler is the Executive Vice President and Chief Legal Officer of Cisco, as well as the Chief Compliance Officer. Uh, interestingly enough, when you think about Cisco, it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, everyone in this room has some experience, perhaps, with the company. Uh, when you think about it, uh, they manufacture, among other things, uh, the software, or the hardware, and the software that drives the internet. Uh, when you think about uh, Cisco for the past two decades, uh, around which uh, I would say Mark has been with the company. Um, they have been the in the top ten of technology firms worldwide um, by market capitalization. Um, in addition to his work at Cisco, uh, Mark has served as a member of the Dean's Advisory Council at Stanford Law School. In addition to that, he serves on the board of directors of the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley. And in addition to that, in 2010, um, notably, he was named to the National Law Journal's 40 Most Influential Lawyers of the Past Decade. In 2013, American Lawyer named him among the top 50 big law firm innovators of the last 50 years. Um, he is a graduate of Stanford Law School and a graduate of Stanford College. And so, let's all welcome Mark Chandler to Wake Forest University. I assume when my, you know, I can hear it's working great. First, I want to say a, a couple of uh, words. I'm incredibly honored and grateful to be able to be here today and share a few thoughts with, with all of you. But before we go further, I just want to say a little bit more about my friend Tom Sager, who uh, in 2013 was, was there with, as an honoree of the top 50 big law innovators of the last 50 years. And uh, I have to say, it, it felt really uh, inappropriate for me to be there in some ways, knowing that Tom was being honored too, because Tom has been an incredible uh, mentor and friend, and also really a leader across the country in ways that, that are affecting the way everybody does in-house law practice everywhere now. That DuPont model had four critical elements, and one was choosing law firms uh, on their ability to demonstrate that they were able to basically play in the sandbox with each other. How do you get different firms to work together appropriately? Second, to leverage technology so that you could drive efficiency, have metrics for how you were doing, uh, and provide the fastest and best results. Third, to, to move toward uh, flat fees and other ways of billing and I know some people call that alternative fee arrangements. I don't like to do that because I think the billable hour should be viewed as the alternative when there's not a better way to measure value. Uh, and finally, the efforts to drive diversity that were a critical part of that in choosing law firms. And I think you know all of us who are following you look at 
and how to do that and how to make sure we're getting the best talent uh, and folks with lots of different perspectives uh, so that we can get the best results from the work we do. And I think uh, everybody owes a great debt of gratitude to you for driving that. And certainly Wake Forest Law School owes a debt of gratitude to, to Tom as well. So let's, let's hear it for Tom. Did I capture the DuPont model? Did I learn? <laughs> but I got it. Up. Anything you'd add to that, or did I? You folks ought to know we're dear friends. We've known each other for many years, and we fed off each other in terms of um, vision and thought process and how we can improve the profession. And Mark's been at the forefront of every area that he's already enunciated, and, and then some. So I'm anxious to hear about him and how he views the competitive landscape and how he deals with companies like Howie. <laughs> Uh, anything you could shed with respect to the challenges you face, uh, General Counsel, in this, in this challenging IT world. Thanks. Is Mr. Bosserman here, by the way? Yes. Great. I know you're coming to work in my department this uh, this summer, and uh, I'm grateful for that and look forward to yes. getting to know you better through that. And I'm glad we're building this association here at Wake Forest. So. Thanks. I'm looking forward to it, too. Okay. We'll just jump in uh, so we get a, a better opportunity to get to know you a little better. Tell us a little bit about your uh, personal background and why law school and what was that experience like? Well, that's a scary question because I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure it's, a, it's an answer that was relevant uh, 40 years ago when I started law school, but, but hopefully isn't as relevant today uh, for good reasons. Um, you know, I had an undergraduate economics degree and I was really interested in uh, the way the political process worked and in trying to make a difference in public policy. Uh, I, you know, had the opportunity to consider going to economics graduate school and didn't really want to do that. It seemed too academic and abstract, and plus I was going to have to learn more math. Uh, and uh, in some ways, uh, law school was, was a default at that time if you weren't quite sure what you wanted to do. And I think uh, some of the things that have gone on in the profession, particularly after the the Great Recession a decade ago uh, have made it that it's, uh, you know, it's hard enough to find a way in law that the law can't be a default. So I, I think all of you probably have uh, a lot better idea of why you came to law school than I did. For, for me, it was a chance to keep getting educated and potentially then be involved in things I was interested in, but without a real, a real strong career goal. And I didn't really think I wanted to practice law either. Uh, I, I, uh, should I go on a little bit? Oh, sure. <laughs> okay, so, so actually, I, I, my, after the first year of law school, I worked uh, uh, in, in the White House in a summer internship with a group of economists that I'd worked with actually when I was an undergraduate. And then second year, I split my summer with two big law firms, with Hale and Dorr uh, in Boston and uh, Cooley, which was then a small San Francisco law firm with six lawyers. <coughs> And I didn't like either one of them, and I had no interest in working at them by the end of the summer. I thought the work was really boring. I didn't really care about what the clients were doing. I didn't think what we were supposed to do, which was to accumulate hours, seemed very interesting either. Uh, and, uh, you know, I didn't look for offers from either of them. I didn't get offers from either of them. I remember the chairman of Cooley, a guy named Jim Gaither, uh, you know, we went out to lunch on the last day, and we... We talked about that and uh, why I wasn't interested and why he wasn't interested. Uh, he later was the chairman of the board of uh, Stanford, and I ran into him at a Stanford Law School event. And we both, you know, at this point, I'd been general counsel at Cisco for seven years, and Jim had moved on to the venture capital world. And we were chatting at this cocktail reception. He said, "He said, have we met before?" I said, "Yeah, the last time I saw you, you fired me." So, uh, uh, eventually. Eventually, I went to work uh, with, uh, after clerking for a dean at, at my law school, who was a special master in a U.S. Supreme Court case, and, and spending a year building a house at the same time. I, uh, uh, I went to work with two guys in a, that I'd met on a political campaign who were starting a small law firm. And I found that just as boring as what I had done in the summer. So after about two years, I decided I was going to leave law, that I made a mistake investing in law school. So I went over to the Stanford uh, Alumni Center and looked through programs to go overseas. Actually, I was looking to 
go get a graduate degree in economics at the London School of Economics and to decide, okay, mistake, we're going to move on. It wasn't exactly fail fast because it was you know, six years after I'd gotten out of college, but there I was. But I found a brochure for something called the Robert Bosch Foundation Fellowship Program in Germany. It brings young professionals from the United States and it will be wrapping up in a year after 40 years in place, or in two years. Uh, it brings 20 young professionals a year to Germany to try to build transatlantic relationships. And this seemed like an interesting boondoggle and uh, could be combined for my wife with the maternity leave. So I applied and I was accepted into this and spent a few months working in the economics ministry in the then capital Bonn, and then several months working for Siemens in Munich. Uh, not in the legal department as it happened in marketing. And I loved being inside a company. I loved being part of an organization that built something that felt that I was part of what was being built. Uh, I could relate to the products. And they offered me a job at the end of that. So I went to work for Siemens in the marketing department uh, and uh, figured I was done with law. I spent five years doing, I mean, a couple of years doing that. By this time, it's 1988. I was being transferred back to Germany, and I interviewed with, on the telephone with my future boss, and he said to me, uh, in Germany, he said, why do I need an American lawyer in Germany? Well, since I hadn't been doing legal work for five years, I thought, this is, you know, this is not going to work out. So I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, I was at a political fundraising event. Uh, Someone I'd known earlier in life was actually running for president and was going to be the nominee of a major party. And uh, so uh, I decided to go. And I met someone there that I had known when I'd been practicing law those two for two years in Palo Alto in 1983, 45. Uh, and I told him I didn't want to go to Germany for this job. And he said, Well, I'm on the board of a company that's looking for a general counsel, and they haven't been able to find anybody they like. You should go talk to them. So I went and met with the CFO, who was the hiring manager. Uh, I sat down for breakfast with him, and he was kind of a larger guy. And I, I ordered some raisin bran and skim milk, and he ordered a three-egg omelet, hash browns, bacon, and toast, and then apologized for what he'd ordered. And I thought, you know, I haven't even said a word, and I've already screwed up this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he ended up, at the end of it, saying, well, uh, you know, everyone we interview from law firms is so legalistic. And you've got business experience. You don't seem to know that much about law, but you're probably smart enough to do this job. So at the age of 32, I was general counsel of a, of a disk drive manufacturer in Silicon Valley that was publicly traded. And was within a year or so, we were Fortune 500. <coughs> so that was kind of funny. Um, what I, uh, I'm not sure I thought it was funny at the time, but it was funny. Uh, so I, uh, I was there for six years, and I learned pretty quickly a couple of key lessons. And one was that I was there uh, to help the business, and to help the business by making sure that legal problems didn't arise, to sort of look a little bit ahead, figure out what was coming down the road, figure out ways to get those things out of the road without interrupting the path that the business was on. Uh, anything we really needed to know law, I knew enough to... Uh, hired the law firm of the guy that had referred me to the job in the first place who was on our board. Um, and uh, everything that involved getting a deal done so that we could finish the quarter, that's what I focused on. I knew how to negotiate deals. I could do that. So, uh, so that's what I did for six years. And then uh, we got bought by Hyundai. I didn't want to go to work for Hyundai. So I, uh, I found a job working for a little networking company called Stratacom and worked there for you know, Maxdor had been a really difficult environment. This is an important lesson. You know, it was an interesting place, but it was a brutal environment. The, you know, 19% gross margins on a happy day, losing money a lot of the time, uh, and uh, run by a group of people who, uh, you know, to say they were jerks is, uh, is probably an understatement. They were not crooks, but they were jerks. Uh, and I had nightmares all the time about them. I mean, really, I'd wake up screaming. Uh, uh, so I had two job opportunities. One was a high-flying company that made speakers for PCs called Creative Labs. And another was Stratacom that had a $17 million quarter, $18 million quarter, and $19 million quarter. It wasn't growing at all. Uh, but 
uh, I really like the people. And I, I said to my wife, I need to, you know, I need to work with people I like for a change. So I went there, and then the public internet happened. And two years later, we sold ourselves to Cisco for $4 billion. Uh, and uh, I found myself inside Cisco. And then speaking of Cisco, I, I did a little research and found that there's a connection between Cisco and, and Wake Forest. In, in 2000, uh, John Chambers, the former CEO of Cisco, gave the commencement address here at Wake Forest University. In addition to that, that same year, his daughter graduated uh, from the college. Uh, he's also been quite generous uh, giving gifts to the university uh, to promote uh, teaching in the area of entrepreneurship, usually related to the, the area of the internet and e-commerce. So could you speak about your relationship with him? Yeah, John, John was a great leader. And, you know, the very first time I met him, I, I learned something from him that I've never forgotten. Uh, the day we closed, we were announced the Stratacom acquisition. We had a reception, a little restaurant in Palo Alto, a very crowded foyer with about 100 people in it. And uh, uh, I met the then general counsel of Cisco first, and I'd never met him before in, in the course of negotiating the deal. And the first thing he said to me is, well, I'm a general counsel, and you're a general counsel, and I'm already here, so what are you going to do? <laughs> it wasn't real welcoming. I've, I've learned from that. I, I do better with companies we acquire now. Um, so I thought about that, and I'll come to that in a second, Professor. Kidding. And the, uh, the, the second thing is I found myself completely accidentally pushed up against John Chambers. And he, he looked at me and said, where's Dick Mullen, who had been the CEO of Stratacom? And I said, oh, he's over there in the corner. I'll, I'll go get him. And John said, no, I'll walk over to him. And it was John's way of saying that uh, having just acquired this company, he did not want the CEO of that company to feel that he was sending someone to fetch him. And uh, that just expressed the way John approached leadership. Uh, you know, many times in dealing with business problems, he would say, uh, how would we feel if we were in the other person's shoes? What would we want us to do then? And I think, uh, you know, when your CEO uh, uses the golden rule every day in business, you have a lot fewer legal problems. I will tell you that. Um, one, one other story, if I might, about John. So just to illustrate this point further, uh, we were in the course of buying another company called Brocade that's now been absorbed actually by Broadcom, but was a competitor of ours at the time. Uh, and we'd done due diligence, and we had gotten to the point where an offer had been accepted, publicly traded company, and we were going to announce this. And everything I'm telling you, you can find in Fortune and Forbes, by the way, uh, except this particular story I'm going to tell about John. Uh, we were going to announce it on a Monday morning, uh, or Sunday night, we were putting out the press release. On uh, Saturday, their outside counsel, who was also the personal counsel of the CEO and was also on the board of directors and also chairman of the audit committee, so there's a, some things to think about there. <laughs> save, that, save, save that for your ethics class. Um, uh, he, a uh, very well-known guy named Larry Sansini, actually, um, uh, he... Uh, uh, he called our outside counsel to say, well, I just want you to know, the last few weeks the audit committee has been looking at some stock option backdating issues and whether the company had issued options at prices lower than what the market price was on the day the grant was made, in which case you'd uh, you know, have a charge you were supposed to take. So we started looking at it and found that this, not only were the CEO's fingerprints on it, but his initials were on it. People were coming into the company, he would assign the price he wanted their options to be at, to give them a big pop right off the top. Uh, we decided we should wait and let them sort that out. I think their hope was the deal would have so much momentum that we would just take it and then take a write down as part of buying the company. Uh, but we decided not to do that, so we had a conference call on Sunday morning with the head of business development, me, John, a couple other people. And uh, the uh, question, and here's the great some governance issues here for you too, huh? Um, and uh, we, um, we were talking about what to do, and the head of business development said, we're almost done with the due diligence. We just have two more folks that we need to talk to, CFO and the uh, former general counsel, and then we can wrap it up. And so we'll do that and then tell them we're putting the deal on hold. And there's a pause, and John said, what 
what do you, uh, uh, what will we learn from this? Maybe we'll put the deal back on based on what we learned in the due diligence. And he said, no, no, we just thought we'd finish it before we put the deal on hold. And John said, how would we feel if we were in their shoes? And we were being acquired by a competitor, and we kept doing, and, and they kept doing due diligence after they knew they weren't moving ahead. And there's a pause, and John said, so what's our plan? And the head of business development said, well, we're going to tell them that we're putting the deal on hold and ask them if they want us to keep finishing the diligence for when we're ready to do the deal, or should we just stop the interviews now? John said, well, that sounds like a good plan. <laughs> but that, that kind of uh, ethical leadership and thinking these things through and, you know, not... Uh, John happens to have had a law degree but never practiced law, but that way of thinking about what the issues are you're going to encounter and looking down the road a little bit and not going the easy path makes my job very easy. When I was his general counsel for 15 years. Um, keeping with that, speaking about the general counsel role, it's obviously multifaceted. What's it like, uh, what's a day in the life of the general counsel at Cisco? Could you also talk a bit about your law department housing? The best part of the job is you never know what's going to happen in the course of a day. I think you agree with that. Um, and the uh, sort of one aspect of that is the chairman of our audit committee once said that the only benefit of being in the audit committee is you get to see all the stupid things the employees do. Um, well, uh, as general counsel, you get to be at the front line of a lot of those things as, as well. It's amazing the stuff that people can do. Um, but in general, what I do in the course of a day is spend a lot of time with my staff because they are the eyes and the ears on what's going on across the whole company. Uh, so I'd say every day I probably have two one-on-ones with members of my staff. I have 12 people who work for me, and I make sure I spend an hour with them every eight days or so with each of them. Uh, I uh, generally try to keep up with a huge flow of email, a lot of which are on public policy issues. What do we do with Chinese competitors who are being threatened by the U.S. government where our salespeople would like to leverage those threats, but we know then there'll be counter-reactions in China if we do that, so we have to tread very carefully on, on that kind of stuff, spend a lot of time on that. Uh, more time than I'd like on litigation, actually, figuring out what our strategy should be. We attract a lot of patent litigation, particularly, which is very popular these days, uh, but there are a lot of legal strategic decisions to make in that space that we spend a lot of time reviewing the cases and figuring out what to do. I'm, I'm not a litigator, but there are business decisions to be made there. Um, interesting. We were talking the other day about uh, your legal department, where your team actually sits and resides. Um, outside of California, where is your legal department in the continental U.S.? Well, we have uh, about 30 people at RTP, where, where you'll be this summer, um, and uh, another 20 or so in Herndon, Virginia, a bunch in New York, some in Richardson, Texas, uh, and then the rest in San Francisco and in, in San Jose, a couple in Boston, some others that are working remotely in, in different parts of the country, and then all around the world. We have, we're in 25 different countries with, with legal staff. Uh, my direct reports, I have one is in Europe, three are on the East Coast, and the rest in California. And you're speaking about governance issues, so I want to um, dive into those a little bit. Obviously, there's a range of them. I wanted to see if you could tell us some of the major governance issues that you encounter, corporate governance issues you encounter in your role, but also uh, we had talked a bit about uh, privacy and human rights issues as they come up in the context of dealing with environmental, social, and governance issues uh, that are grabbing the attention of impact investors, but also public at large. Yeah, I think from a, from a governance standpoint, uh, it was a really interesting journey because when uh, we've been a we were an overgrown startup by the by the late '90s, uh, and uh, uh, did not have a lot of governance structure. Uh, and when Sarbanes Oxley was coming along uh, in 2001, after the uh, crash of the tech sector, particularly, we had to figure out how to get ahead of that, but do it in the in the right way. Um, and the right way was not going to be to lecture my board of directors about how stupid and wrong they've been. I had just become general counsel at that point. I didn't think it was a good way to start. Uh, the president of Stanford happened to be on our board at that time. And uh, I brought in 
uh, a governance expert from Stanford who ran the Corporate Governance Center there uh, to talk a little bit about uh, what he thought were the most important elements to think about, not tying it directly to the statute. But he was very good at, at seeing out ahead of where things were coming. And we came up with six basic principles to follow in terms of how we documented what our board committees did, what types of things needed review, how we tracked different types of transactions. And that largely covered everything that came out in the statute. So we were, we were in good shape as a result. Today, the issues are more a matter of staying ahead of what the, tr the trends in the governance are, what, kind, what, what should be our committee's focus. You know, we, our chairman and CEO are the same person. Uh, we have a very strong lead independent director, which is a, a statutorily mandated position under Sarbanes Auction, so I tend to think that separating chairman and CEO is, is BS. Uh, uh, if you have a strong lead independent director, because the chair has no particular duties uh, anyway, the lead independent director does. Uh, so managing our communications on that issue is part of it. Uh, we've stepped up the role of our audit committee to take a broader look at cyber issues, because we obviously are concerned about uh, uh, that from the standpoint of protecting our own assets, as well as the fact that we're the world's largest internet security company. If our products are screwed up in any way uh, and our customers feel the effect of that, we'd have huge problems. So that's, a, that's an area of emerging board oversight for us. And a couple of things. I just was curious. Uh, Cisco makes uh, products that help institutions um, be more effective and more efficient. With respect to your own legal department, how do you use those tools internally to deploy them? Well, the, the Cisco really builds networks as a whole. So we're a user of the network, obviously. We use a lot of the collaboration tools we build. Uh, WebEx interactions are, you know, for video meetings across the world uh, with our customers and internally. Uh, for our own department, uh, we don't make people fly a lot. We can do it by video, which works, and you already know the people. First meeting is good sometimes to, to be in person. Uh, we, uh, we use a lot of collaboration tools to share information about what's going on. Our, we have some team products that uh, allow groups to be set up for informal communication. So instead of trying to track a, an email thread in 20 different directions, you get it all in one space where the people are going back and forth. Uh, so we do that a lot. But we try to take almost everything we do in a legal department and say, how can we do this better if we automate it? or make it more efficient. Simple agreements like non-disclosure agreements or staff around the world go out and generate their own, not the legal department, because we've built tools that the questionnaires built in so that people can, uh, can uh, salespeople, for instance, can fill it out, get all the requisite information. There's some trick questions that have trap doors underneath them, and if they answer those wrong, then they do get to work with someone in the legal department. Um, you know, are you planning to transfer ownership of our intellectual property? Then? <laughs> uh, but, and we've automated a lot of the contract creation process, our templates, and then a lot of what we measure, how long it takes us to finish different types of transactions so we can think through how do we change the way we do that to make it faster and easier for our customers. All right, and what I wanted to do, too, is uh, save some time so we, I could ask you some other questions about some of the other interests that you have. Um, I picked it up from a couple of places. I heard that you're very passionate about education. And could you speak where that uh, passion or that interest in education comes from? Is this something you're interested in, too, Professor? Just a little. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife has read his bio and, and uh, thinks you're very cool, as I told you. Oh, that's great. She thinks what you're doing is <laughs> pretty cool. So, uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, my wife uh, was in education. She, she was going to start at Stanford Law School. She got within a week of doing that after working in the Hill for two years and then decided, and this was in 1991, uh, to bag law school and uh, uh, become a teacher and Teach for America in the second year of the program. So she moved to Oakland, California, was a teacher in the Oakland Public School. The program was two years long. She stayed in Oakland for six years. Uh, she loved it. Then she moved to D.C. and uh, was a teacher in D.C. public schools for three years. And for the last six years, she's run a, what's called a, a, a collective action organization, collective impact organization, where you try to bring together all the stakeholders to be in a room. And this meant the school district, the 
philanthropies that are uh, funding projects in the schools, the nonprofits that are doing projects in the schools, the people who keep the data, bring them together, look at some particular issues, and try to figure out how do we solve these problems together. And it was sort of great because it required some interesting skills. You had to be very data analytic, and she hired data scientists to really measure what's working, what's not. Some political skill to figure out which issues were the ones you'd really want to approach and which ones you'd blow the whole thing up because they were, you know, like third rails on a subway on a railroad. And, uh, and then uh, some leadership and how to get everyone to come to the table and stay there. Uh, so it was great stuff, and she's so passionate about it that that rubs off. And my daughter, as it happens, uh, when she got out of college, she did Teach for America as well in, uh, in New York City and Crown Heights in Brooklyn. So I've got, I've got it all around me. Okay. Mm -hmm. I also, too, wanted to hear a little bit about your affiliation with the Law Foundation of Silicon Valley and your interest in that particular organization. Well, the Law Foundation is the largest provider of pro bono legal services in Silicon Valley. And, and the Silicon Valley is a, uh, is a center of great wealth. The, uh, the products that get built by technology companies, because they take advantage of, of a global network, are instantly useful around the world. We develop a better switch or a better collaboration tool. It will be used in New Delhi as quickly as it will be used in New Jersey. Uh, and that means that you build your markets very, very quickly and investors believe in it. So uh, a lot of millionaires and billionaires get made in Silicon Valley. Uh, at the same time, uh, the housing prices have risen rapidly, and there's a huge homelessness problem right in our own backyard. Uh, and uh, landlords have a huge incentive to try to evict people from their homes. All the other social ills that we see around the country, from domestic violence to just little disputes people are having with each other where they can't get access to the courts, are present there as well. I'm also on the board of the Second Harvest Food Bank in Silicon Valley. We feed. 250,000 people a month in San Mateo and Santa Clara counties, right in the heart of Silicon Valley. So there's tremendous needs there. And the Law Foundation uh, has a staff of about 40, uh, mostly attorneys, uh, doing pro bono work and does a great job of reaching out. I bring teams of people from Cisco in for we'll have an eviction day or something like that where we can get people working on a bunch of cases together. The staff there is great and that we can take things as far as we can in in the day of getting the filings done, and then the staff there can do the follow-up. Uh, so it's a, it's a great organization. And uh, as a board member, one of my jobs is to, uh, is to call law firms that uh, do a lot of work with Cisco and say to them, you know, you do a lot of work with us, and part of what's important to us is how we're active in the community. And please join me in supporting this organization. So I raise money for them, too. All right. And it sounds like that's effective, very effective. Well, we grow in the organization, and it's harder because the, the government funding has been reduced lately for pro bono legal services, so we rely more on our friends to help get that done. Um, and now I want to talk a few, about a few things of interest to the, I would say, the student's future um, and developing not just a, a job or getting jobs, but developing a career. Um, if, could you offer students advice concerning the types of skills that they'll need, not now or not 40 years ago? but in the future, and how that intersects with new technologies uh, such as artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things. Yeah, I'm, I'm really lucky in that on the new things that are coming along, I can kind of fake it. You know, I'm 63, so I just have to get through a few more years, and then I'm going to have to worry about learning new things. Right, Tom? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I never want to stop learning new things, actually. So uh, I drive my staff crazy that way. Um, the, uh, a personality problem, I think. Uh, I think that the, uh, the legal profession has been slower than, than a lot of knowledge-based industries to uh, be affected by the uh, changes in knowledge management that have uh, come about because of the networking of information. But, I, but that's changing. Uh, it's going to change rapidly in the corporate arena because of what's going on in Europe with the accounting firms being allowed to practice law, uh, and they are driving huge change in the way work gets done and the price at which it gets done, and that's going to force the law firms to adapt. The law firms came through the 
uh, downturn, figuring out that they could outsource a lot of the work that they hired young associates to do to machines to do discovery, which we use very aggressively internally, for instance, and huge two orders of magnitude cost reduction compared to using people. Uh, and a lot of that work also can be outsourced and offshore and done in, uh, in uh, law factories in, uh, out of this country where labor costs are a lot lower. So I think one of the things that law students should come out and be adept at is understanding how those tools work so that you can present yourself as someone who can run those tools and improve those tools uh, and use those tools uh, as opposed to someone who's uh, afraid of them. And then second is to understand how information is developed and put together using technology. I think briefs that are <coughs> submitted by lawyers uh, have always had a fair amount of fake news in them, you might say. Uh, people trying to make arguments and stretching a little far. Uh, I don't think it's a good way to write a brief. I like to be honest about what the weaknesses are as well. I once had dinner with a federal judge in, uh, in uh, California who, uh, who asked me if Cisco had ever been sued meritoriously. Uh, and I said, you know, after I've read the complaint, it's full of so much BS, I can't tell anymore. Um, and she said, well, I want you to know that there are some lawyers that when I get their briefs, I tell my clerks, don't even bother checking the sites. This person always tells it the way it is. And I have other lawyers where I say, I want you to double check every single thing that person says. Lesson there. But I think we're going to have more and more information presented in a way that seems real that is going to be made up. Uh, and uh, the AI algorithms do a great job at ferreting out lots and lots of truths that we wouldn't see and can also have built-in biases that will mean the information that presented doesn't reflect reality. And the ability of lawyers to figure out which is which will be a differentiating characteristic for those of you who know how to do that and know how to pick apart what the other side is saying and doing and the kind of things that are being presented as data that may be opinion or worse. And then just uh, one more follow-on before we open it up to questions. And it's related to some of the things you've already been speaking of, but when you hire attorneys for your own um, internal department, what makes for a good attorney? Um, a huge set of, I'd say three things. First, a huge sense of curiosity. I'm looking for people that really want to understand how stuff works and aren't just interested in a narrow view of what's my job going to be and, and what is the legal department to do, but wants to know what our company does and why we do it that way. Because the critical thing we offer as an in-house legal department is being part of the business uh, and uh, not part of the, uh, not just looking at things through a legal lens and then letting everyone else figure it out. Uh, I have a little rock that sits on my desk that I had made and engraved in the rock it says nothing is written in stone. Uh, and uh, you know, the exceptions to that are, are, I'd say, ethics and things that are illegal. We don't, we don't go there if it violates our code of ethics or if something's illegal, but everything else We've got to be flexible enough to figure out what's the business trying to accomplish, not what's the, on the one hand, the other hand, legal arguments. So that's number one. Number two is um, uh, a, uh, a willingness to speak up. I have to do three things to be successful in my job. The first is I've got to see around corners a little bit, and I've got you know, close to 40 years of experience now where when I get information, I can make a judgment about what's, how things are likely to play out and seize an opportunity for the company or mitigate a risk, whatever it is, mobilize resources to do those. Uh, so that's the strategic part of my job on every issue I deal with, um, anticipate. Uh, second, to do that, I need people to talk to me. So I do roundtable lunches with 12 people who aren't my direct reports every week or so. Every chance I get to talk to people who've left the company and find out what do you like about what was a bad experience. I do. I have an interview like that tomorrow with somebody who just left to be general counsel of another company. Um, but I need people to talk to me. Uh, and, uh, and so I need to hire people who seem ready to really engage and aren't intimidated in any way, but are just going to 
tell me what's really going on. Um, and third, the third thing in my job is I need to feed them and care for them so they'll stick around and get more information themselves that they can share with me. So I'd say that the characteristics that you want to project a real curiosity about what the, what the business is if you're going in-house or what the business of the law firm is, you know, who are our most important clients? You know, where do we make our profits? What do, what's the best thing I can focus on to be effective in this business of running a law firm? Uh, and then not be shy about asking these questions, but be, be out there. I think it's, you know, it's the biggest lesson I learned from my random walk through life of meeting people at political fundraisers who got me a job someplace or walking into the alumni office to look for economics graduates programs that end up in Germany. Um, is when someone that you trust uh, tells you you can do something that you tell yourself you can't do, listen to them, not to yourself. Um, and people you trust will push you and guide you in a way that will give you opportunities you otherwise wouldn't know. I, I had a, a woman on my staff in my office a couple of weeks ago, and we, uh, we were dealing with a very complicated issue involving a, a former employee who had figured out how to get access back into our systems and had done some damage to the systems. And, uh, you know, my hope is that, that he ends up taking a plea on this because we don't really want to have a big trial about, about this. But uh, we needed someone who would be able to reach out through his lawyer and make this case. And I talked to this woman on my staff, and I, I said, uh, you know, I can't, will you do this? And she said, well, I'm a little nervous. I've never done this before. I don't think I can do it. And I looked at her, I said, you know, I know you can do it. So I need you to stand up and say, I can do this and I will do this. And she thought about it and she said, okay, I will do this. And she went and did it. And she learned that she was capable of doing something. I've worked with her for five years. She's smart. She's thoughtful. She projects very well. I knew she could do it. She'd never done it before. She thought she couldn't do it. She did it. And Telling yourself that is really important. You know, there's the old male-female gender thing that if there's a job with ten characteristics and a guy thinks he meets five of them, he says, that's great, I can do five and I can convince them I'll learn the other five. Where the woman knows, can do eight of them, she'll say, well, I better not apply. I don't have all of the prerequisites. And, you know, it's a cliche and it's, it's uh, you know, a sexist cliche, but uh, I think not untrue in some ways in terms of the way we undersell ourselves. Uh, so I, I think it's really important, I would say, to find people who will push you and then listen to them. And yeah, and that's, and that's some great advice, and it's a, it's a good segue into questions. And so speak up, don't be shy, <laughs> ask questions. So any questions from the audience? Yeah, sure. Hi. What's your name? Uh, Agneta. Uh, hey. I'm from Latvia. I'm actually not from the U.S. Um, I was wondering, uh, in your job, do you ever have to, like, kind of weigh uh, the general purpose of a corporation, which is to make profit, versus other purposes which it might have, like thinking about sustainability, thinking about environmental implications, like thinking about uh, not just making the profit for the shareholders, but what it means to the company's employees. Like, do you ever have to have these considerations? Well, uh, in your role as a general counsel? There's a, I think there, there should be for every general counsel a happy coincidence between those things because in the long term, value is created for your shareholders by running your company correctly. In the case of Cisco, we were on Barron's list of most sustainable large companies. We were number one in 2017 and we were number two in 2018. We think that's just because they wanted to share the love with somebody else. <laughs> we're going to try to number one again this year. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you have other stakeholders, employees, for instance, that you have to care about. If you mistreat your employees and, they, and they, you know, the good ones, you know, when people are unhappy in a company, I'll tell you, it's the best people who leave first because they're the ones who, who find the jobs most easily somewhere else. So you have to be thinking about that. I think it's very short-sighted not to be. So do I have times when you have to trade those off? You know, um, uh, you can always argue about how quickly you can do certain things based on 
the different needs of different stakeholders. How do you allocate resources? How much, how much do we spend on making sure that uh, talented employees that haven't gotten raised for a couple of years get a raise? And how do you balance that against uh, uh, making commitment that you're going to generate, pay for enough solar power to generate all the power you use in your company? And how do you balance that against the fact that you told your investors that you would make 72 cents a share next quarter? And balance that against the fact that there are new cyber threats emerging all the time, and we need to make sure that we are protecting our customers' data uh, from, you know, where we're offering a service where we handle their data, or that we're delivering a product that doesn't have vulnerabilities in it. How quick, quickly can you fix a, a vulnerability that might allow someone to access and disable the product that you're selling. So uh, you always have those trade-offs. The question is whether you, do you have all the right issues on the table so that you're actually considering them and recognizing what you're not doing. I think where people get into trouble is when they discount some of those important stakeholders and say, well, we're not going to pay attention to that because we're only driven by earnings per share. That's where you get into the mistake. Um, you know, I'm lucky to work in a company where our leadership team is, is pretty committed to looking across the full spectrum of, of issues that we have to deal with, and uh, we're capable of having you know, honest, open discussions about this. Uh, and then uh, when we resolve them, we get in line and we march. You, know, you can't hold the grudge afterwards. You have to say, OK, we had a good discussion. Uh, I've never been in a position where we're doing something that I thought was illegal. That's, you know, that's important to me. Thanks, Yes. Hi. Uh, well, I have an observation and then a question. And my observation is that we seem to attract the best speakers to a series that's named after Tom Sager. And it's probably... Uh, Not an accident. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Suzanne Rawls. I'm the dean of the law school. It's oh, hi. Chris Swecker sends regards. Yeah. Um, I'm meeting my, him later today. Yeah. Helping with something. Great. My question is, uh, from your experience, would you redesign anything about the a legal education? What would you do differently, if anything, about the um, curriculum, extracurricular experiences of a legal education? Um, I'm, I'm getting some. Uh, Insights into this from two perspectives, right, from three pers different perspectives right now. One is from hiring law school graduates. The second is because uh, I am involved at, at my alma mater and some of the uh, debates that they're having about how to how to look at legal education going forward. And third, I have a son who's, who's a one L in Los wow. Angeles, so so I hear about it all the time. Um, the uh, uh, I would say three things. Two are the ones I alluded to before, which is helping people who are student, your students to understand uh, what the tools are they're actually going to be using day to day in law firms, what law firms and, and other legal practitioners and in-house uh, operations are doing. So if they come out actually understanding how to do that stuff beyond uh, knowing the, you know, the, the Langellian canon. Um, and uh, which is you know important. I had a lot of fun talking to torts and contract cases with my son, um, and I'm, I'm glad he's, he's learning that. It's you know, a critical part of what I do every day is being able to do that legal analysis. Uh, but having people come out knowing how e-discovery works and knowing knowing some of those things that are actually going to happen, maybe clinics are the way to do that, or externships. Uh, uh, we've created a program where we bring in students for seven months in the, after the, at the end of the second year of law school, beginning of third, and uh, we pay them. And now the ABA lets people get credit in, be paid, we encourage the schools to give them credit. Uh, and we put them through a pretty rigorous program of actually learning how to do things in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and uh, we've done that with Indiana University, with Colorado University, with I think it's Southern Law School in, in uh, New Orleans. and. Uh, so that's number one. Number two is the point about understanding, getting really good BS detectors on how data manipulation works these days and how information is presented, how to dissect uh, fake news, as I said. Uh, third, I think, 
it's important to bring that into the curriculum so that it becomes part of the way the canon is taught. And that's really hard because that involves faculty having to learn new skills and new approaches to, to, uh, to a program where they've built a curriculum and a way of teaching year after year. And, and Dean, I don't you know, envy you that part of the task. But I think, I think it's really important that the, that the uh, professor think about how that is going to play out and, and what needs to change in terms of what they deliver. That part of that, by the way, the great university like Wake Forest is also figuring out how to leverage other parts of the university uh, so that law students are, you know, so that everyone comes out with law and something else in the sense that I really have some depth of knowledge about coding and computer science or depth of knowledge about real estate or, you know, whatever it is, but, you know, not to ignore the rest of the university. Gosh, I'm so glad I asked that because we're doing all of that. <laughs> <laughs>